But I just want to say, um, this whole topic of social mobility, I was um, thinking about this as I thought about my own um, work in our own organization. And as you heard Mark say, Mark, thank you for um, having me this morning to be able to say that, you know, we've been focused on um, our work that we like to say we're helping people realize their full potential. And it wasn't until last week I was in a senior team meeting and I, um, I pulled some research on social mobility. I pulled some articles, some research articles, because I wanted to better understand it in order to talk to you just a little bit about it this morning. I am by no means an expert. So today, this session is meant to be interactive. So we're gonna have an interactive session with you and I need to start, can I get 20 volunteers? I need 20 people for me to line up over here. Come on, you don't have to run, not gonna make you do push-ups or something. I need 20, 20 people, please. 20 people, you just come up to the front. Nothing strenuous, but I do need about 20 people. We got two, four, six, eight, nine. I need a couple more, 20. They're still coming. And if you just line up in a single line for me. Okay, we got about 20. Whatever number comes, that's the number we're gonna take this morning. So I'm gonna start by asking this group, could you all just stand in a single file line for me? About, about the same? You do. Okay, here's, here's the exercise. So when I, this is like Simon says a little bit. So Simon will say, when, if this relates to you, can you just follow through on what I said, okay? If you have no debt in your life, take one step forward. <laughs> See, we're doing good. Take one step back if you've ever had to wear a uniform anywhere you've ever worked. Take one step forward if you have great medical and hospital insurance. Take one step back if you've ever shared a bedroom with a family member. Take two steps forward if you've ever inherited any money or property. Take one step back if you've ever had to go through a metal detector to enter school. One step back. You ever tell. Take two steps forward if your household, if you have a household budget and you stick to it. <laughs> See, we got some really disciplined people in the room. Take one step back if you came, ever came home to an empty house after school. Take one step forward if you pay someone to do your house or yard work. <laughs> Take one step forward if you're the first person in your family to graduate from college. Take one step forward if you've ever had to use your social connection to get a job. <laughs> Take one step back if you've ever worn hand-me-down clothes. Take one step back if you ever had to walk or use public transportation to go anywhere. Take one step forward if you have a family member who could loan you money. Take one step forward if you grew up in a house with more than 50 books. We're almost done. Take, take one step forward if you attended a private school, not on a scholarship. Wait, take one step back if you ever received free or reduced lunch. Take one step back if you've ever purchased something on layaway. And take one step forward if you're sure you'll have enough money for retirement. <laughs> now, if we were gonna start a marathon this morning, right, and I were to say go, what's wrong with this picture? Right? Everyone's not starting from the same line. Can we give our volunteers a hand of applause this morning, right? Mm -hmm. That, that's really the, one of the points that I really wanted to make is, you know, when we think about social mobility, um, I'm gonna have a seat. I said I wanted to have coffee and conversation, but I feel like kind of standing, but we'll, I'm gonna try to sit down with you this morning. 
if I don't knock this table over in the process. <laughs> and I'm still sounding good to myself, two at a time. Just want you to know. So social mobility, when we think about it, and I was thinking about the work we were doing at United Way of Delaware, I was saying that's really, this, this illustration is really a picture of what we're trying to do. We're trying to level the playing field so that people get out of the gate, right, to have the same opportunities. But the sheer reality is when social mobility, and I know we talked about, we just said click this, right? There we go. Is our definition, right? It's the ability of individuals or groups to be able to move up and down the social ladder. And we talked about what some of those barriers were, right, to being able to happen. But the very first barrier that's documented in the research is really, it's where you're born to. You know, it's by luck of the draw, right? It's your zip code that determines how well you get out of the gate and where your beginning point is in life. And so at United Way, one of the things that we've been working to do, I'm oh, sorry, I don't want to get ahead. So we pulled some, um, some of those barriers, and if you could read this, you really have um, better eyes than I do. But the, we pulled some work from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and what it was actually showing was, um, if you look at the life of Bill, um, Gates, he really didn't have many barriers as, as he kind of moved along. And his wife, Melinda, the main barrier she had was gender. But if you look at someone else who, you know, we'll say this person is from Sussex, right, or from in, in Delaware, there's numerous barriers, starting from their age, starting from their zip code, starting from the schooling that they had, starting their ability to have transportation, all of those things really impede an individual's ability to be able to move from one place to the next. And quite honestly, the research um, also was talking about those barriers. I know we heard Mark say, which is great, right? You know, we have a lot of people in our community that cross this stage, right, and graduate and move from one level to the next. But the research says it is extremely hard to get families to move from one class to the next. And that, you know, and one of the core things that happens around that is just sheer proximity, right? So where people live, if you can actually, if people can move from one zip code to another zip code, if one of the solutions around, if we can get people to think about housing and where they live, if we could integrate more of housing vouchers, not just to be segregated in um, high impoverished areas, but being able to integrate them in high um, income areas, that those things make a difference. I can tell you I'm a product of that, right? So I was born to a single mother, um, lived pretty much, I would say, hardworking, always had a job, um, myself and my two siblings. But, you know, I would, you know, characterize our jobs that we probably were fairly poor. My husband likes to remind me that all the time, that, um, you know, he kind of saved us along the way. But um, one of the things that made a difference for us was at 10, my mom got married. And we moved from one zip code to another zip code. We moved, I went from a single family household to a two family, you know, parent household. We went from a, a place, right, that where, you know, there was um, most of the people who lived in our community were single families, more, I think, definitely more of impoverished communities, till we moved to the suburbs. And so I think about that often in our, in my work, we try to get people to do something that's called a life map, to try to say what were those defining points that happened in your life that actually made a difference. And for me, as I was thinking about this morning to you, I would say I, that, for me, made the difference. I'm not sure where my life would have been had we stayed in the environment that, that I was in originally. And so, you know, that doesn't happen to a lot of people, right, where you can just move from one to the other. But it's those types of changes that actually change the outcomes where I was actually the first person in my family to graduate from college. And I don't take that um, lightly, but it was the opportunities that were then afforded to me that would have never been afforded to me in, in the old environment. And so at United Way, I'm really, really passionate about a few things in the work we're doing that I think are all tied to social mobility. And you heard Mark talk about them. One is, what can we do, right, as a community to ensure that more kids actually are reading on grade level by the end of third grade? 
And why is that important is because where kids are by the end of third grade is a strong indication of where they'll finish up, right? And so that downstream work really matters. And then it's this work that we're doing in the middle school, high school space, early post-secondary, is how do we get more families to actually be prepared to be your workforce? How do we get more um, young kids, not just to have the educational background, but the soft skills that employers are looking for, right, to be employable, so that they can competitively compete? Because remember the picture up here, right? They're not starting at the same point, right? So the work that we're doing collectively with our partners is to try to level set that. So how do we take them from the time that they're born, from birth, right, to kindergarten, to third grade, to eighth grade, to 10th grade, to 12th grade, to post-secondary? How do we help them catch up over that period of time? It takes all of us thinking about how do we partner and how do we think differently about our work and the work that's ahead of us, right? And then last but not least, we want more families to be financially stable and empowered, right? We want them to have the livable wage. I think I heard someone say, like, you know, one of the solutions is you got to be able to get people jobs, and you got to be able to give them, you know, more than just jobs. You got to give them a career lattice where they feel like they can move up. And you have to make sure that you are giving them the same opportunities where they can sustain their families, right? So that they too can have a budget, where they too can make sure they're sticking to it, where they can have a rainy day fund and they can save for their kids' college education and they can be prepared for retirement. All of those things, right? How do we help more families to be able to do that, right? I think um, it would be a fairy tale if I would sit up, stand up here or sit up here this morning to say, that we can just do that, right? Even if every, if every one of us in the room even agreed that we were going to be able to wipe that out, right? I think, you know, that not, it'd be a lot of work because it's hard and complex and deep-rooted, but we can help more, more, more people cross this stage to be able to graduate. One at a time, 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 and I think that's part of the work, right, that we have um, ahead of us. And so we believe that the solution really is around collective impact, if we're really going to get to improve in social mobility. That it's not about working in our silos, if we're going to be able to achieve this. Because to move kids, and it starts with kids, right? To be able to move them from one level to the next level to the next level to the next level requires all of us to be thinking about how we work together today differently. And I would kind of envision it, I'm a visual person, so I kind of envision like, you know, what's the ecosystem of Sussex County? Like, what are all the parts of this that have to happen from the early education to I heard the educational system, our middle schools and high schools, what does post-secondary look like? What types of jobs, you know, quality jobs that lead to livable wage, right, are available for people to have careers? What are we doing around the transportation system to ensure, right, that people have access to transportation? All of those things are intertwined, right, and all of those things work together to be able to figure out what's next. And so, you know, part of the conversation with you this morning is really to think about, you know, when you think about the work we're doing, how do we help more people win the social mobility marathon? What do you think that it actually looks like? And so I wanted to kind of pause here and have, I know we just had Bobby kind of throw out that says, what is social mobility? But I really want to talk to you a little bit about what do you think some of the solutions are, some of the bright spots that we're already working on in Sussex County that we can need to leverage? Because it is in some cases, right, it's about, I think we help a lot of people, but I don't think we help enough people. And I think that we do good work, but sometimes good isn't enough to really to get to the impact that we're ultimately trying to be able to see. So, you know, anyone in the room want to start by telling me what do you think, what some of the bright spots are, or some things that you think we need to focus on? Anyone? Oh, sorry, someone in the back room. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm Carolyn O'Neill from Cheer Senior Services, and I think we need to look at the demographics of our population, especially with the influx of seniors coming to Sussex County. Uh, many of them are not driving anymore. Many of them should not be driving anymore. Yeah. Uh, so we need to think about public transportation for seniors. Cheer has 17 buses that we put on the, 
on the road to uh, our senior centers and take our seniors to activities. But that's not enough. And the infrastructure, especially on the eastern side, is so congested um, that even you and I have trouble driving down there. So I really think we need to consider our senior population. Uh, it seems to be the white elephant in the room every time you, know, you talk about things. Uh, people are coming here, and then on the opposite end of the spectrum, on the west side of the county, there's pro no public transportation to even speak of, and the rural seniors over there can't get around at all unless they have family. So that's something that really needs to be considered. Thanks. You know, one of the things before, if there's um, comments, I just want to comment on this. I also serve on the Kent County, the Greater Kent has the Economic Development Workforce Committee. And they had some data, and it was actually showing how Sussex, I think, was one of the fastest growing like populations for people to retire to, right? And it dawned on me, it's just the thought, right? It's just, you know, dawned on the world according to Michelle, that says instead of maybe fighting against that, right? And this is where people really want to migrate to, how do we really make it the best place, right, for people to retire? So to the point that was made that there's actually supports and services in place for people really to transition over the period of time from when they're mobile and less mobile. And what would that look like for business and economic development, right? So the types of businesses we would want to need here and the types of services that we would want to attract would look totally different um, than what we have today. And you would still need, um, Mark, um, you know, we, we need um, professionals to be able to support those, right, and to be able to run those businesses. So, you know, it was just the thought, you know, as, as I was listening to the data as they were reporting, is that sometimes we fight against the trend. Maybe it's, you know, and, and there may already be those conversations that's taken place, but how might, if we really were going to imagine what would a thriving community that's really meant to support um, the most, the, the, the mature, senior population, what would those services look like and businesses? Any other thoughts? Hi. One of the great things that we do have in Sussex County is every seven miles there is an institution that provides early liter literacy opportunities for children age zero to adults 99 plus. We offer free Wi-Fi. We offer programs to help people learn. We have job fairs. We have all of these things that would help, but we're very underutilized and underfunded. We're libraries. Where else can you go to get all of these things for free? So that's something to think about too. Maybe start using the libraries more, promoting the libraries more, and funding the libraries more. Mm -hmm. But we do have services that we can offer to assist, and we'd love to make partnerships. Thank you. Any thoughts on that? I told you I'm a visual person, so when you were saying there's free Wi-Fi, right, and you were just saying, so I was like, wow, everywhere you go in Sussex, there's free Wi-Fi. <laughs> Any other comments? I'm Don Clark. I'm retired. I was with uh, BB and Nanakoke Hospitals in long-range planning. I was at the Oak Orchard Boys and Girls Club last Saturday where the local Knights of Columbus donated 20 winter coats to the kids. And I got talking to the director of the Boys and Girls Club. He's seeing a real increasing trend in grandparents raising these young kids. Many times the parents are incarcerated for drug problems, or it's a single mother who can't afford to keep the kids. So he even provides a Thanksgiving dinner for the children, and he was telling me many of the younger children didn't even know what Thanksgiving was. They had to explain to them what the holiday was all about. So I think your discussion about getting to the kids before third grade is really important. And I, I was very impressed with the role that the Boys and Girls Club was taking. He's got over 100 kids there that come after school every day. Thank you. Thanks. I like to do a plug for the Boys and Girls Clubs. No, they're not here. Is anyone here from the Boys and Girls Club? 
I want to, there we have someone there. I want to do, you want to do your own plug? I was going to, you want to do your plug? <laughs> I think, the, you know, the Boys and Girls Club is an amazing um, organization, and they are definitely one of our um, core partners. And the, the whole point of out of school and after school time, and, and particularly for a kid, for kids that come from high need communities, that time is extremely important. And so for legislators in the room, I know that there still are not enough resources. The same thing right here with the libraries, right? And, uh, and around to expand capacity. You heard me say that before, right? So we're helping, but we could help a lot more kids and families if we really had the resources to be able to, um, to do that. <laughs> but I'll, good morning. Um, my name is Pat Campbell White. I've done one thing for the last 46 years, well, mainly, and that's to be a realtor um, and touched every segment of the county as a trainer and, and so forth. However, um, I commend County Council and our planning and zoning and go back to the uh, one of my former students who has been a teacher to me, which is Mr. Conway. And um, Think about the role that housing plays in our life. We've, I doubt there are many of us in this room that have ever been homeless, but we see a huge trend of that here in the county, and I find it unfathomable. And where I commend the council and, and our county is we've struggled, we've worked toward approving and trying to get workforce housing and efforts in the county where we create more affordable housing, and, but we also are hit with that Here's this huge intermigration of people who can afford to buy homes here, but we need to look around and look at housing that the people that are here can afford so we can stop that out-migration. Uh, of my five grandchildren, only one of them's out-migrated so far, uh, and he's up in Pennsylvania working and doing very well. So look around us, look at job opportunities, and let's look at housing, whether it's rental housing or opportunities to um, create more affordable housing and how that can happen um, so that we can, we always hear about strip, st stripping off regulations. Let's make sure, and I think I will tell you in working with realtors from other counties and other states, we have the lowest number of regulations I've ever seen. Mm. Now that's comparatively, it still feels like there's a lot, but let's make sure we have regulations that serve a purpose and not just aren't busy work to give somebody a job. But let's really look in the area. I, the lady from the library, I wish you had identified yourself by name. You just hit me up the side of the head with a two before. Thank you. I never looked at a library the way that you described it. And maybe there's somebody else in the room that would admit that as well. Um, there are a lot of needs out there. If anybody, is there, are there any Rotarians in the room or Lions Club members or Kiwanis members or Knights of Columbus members? The gentleman from the, um, um, hi Don. Um, that talked about the coats. Mm. I mean, we get, we get calls from the schools all the time, and we need coats. And the ways that we can go out in our community and deliver food, the backpack program that sends food home with children every weekend. Uh, they leave, and maybe people in here don't know about that, but a child will leave school uh, Friday afternoon with a backpack of food. Mm -hmm. And uh, because one teacher heard a kid say to his little brother, Hurry up and eat everything you can in school on Friday because we won't get any more food again until we come back to school on Monday morning. And thank heavens for the churches and the organizations that we have that fulfill that need. But there's a lot of need in Sussex County that many of us are probably very blind. Sorry, I don't mean to lecture, but it's, it, I go back to Maslow's food, clothing, and shelter. And there's way too many people that we see day in and day out who are still trying to meet those three basic needs. Thank you. Thank you. I heard, you know, the first thing that, you know, two things just struck me. I think Bobby had given some stats, right? The homelessness has increased in Sussex County by 50%, did you say? So 50% over the last year, right? So that's something it seems as a county that we need to be able to address. And the second point is the percentage of what people are paying on housing. They're paying 30% or more of their income, right, on affordable housing. Housing is um, a huge issue. I did see, um, I was doing a, a study from another community and for the mayors, I see um, Ted in the room, that one of the um, a community actually made a commitment. They actually decreased their homelessness 
um, in 100 days as a start, they, they intently went after getting 100 people in 100 days to get them housing, and they did that by working, it was a mayor's initiative, and working with about 100 community partners to make that happen. And then over a three-year period, they actually reduced it by 50%. So that homelessness almost is almost um, non-existent in their community, and they had to do it through finding housing. So that could be in this afternoon, in your, or later this morning, in your breakouts, that might be a great place to be able to have some conversation to dig into. Any other thoughts? Sorry, we have someone. I think education in Sussex County is very important and with our growing population of seniors and the need to for social mobility here I think maybe it's time for some disproportionate help for Dell Tech and Sussex Tech to provide uh, the education for our young people uh, in skilled positions that, that we have the need for in construction and healthcare especially uh, to try to help with the, the issues that we're facing. Our, our population is, is growing uh, faster than the other two counties and has been for many years now and I think it's time for us to, uh, to catch up in that and be able to uh, do more here. Uh, I was told a number of years ago that uh, Dell Tech, uh, for instance, it, the, you, they couldn't add any more programs because they did not have classroom space. They were completely booked here for classroom space. Uh, the University of Delaware could not expand here if they wanted to because they, there was no space. And uh, I think that's important that we recognize the need here. There are good paying jobs, and as was mentioned earlier by Mr. Conway, uh, in, in the construction field, there are good paying jobs in healthcare, and we need, there is a need here for that, and um, I think we need to definitely focus uh, more on these uh, post-secondary um, and even uh, Sussex Tech vocational school opportunities. Great. Thank you. So there's two hands over here. Did you see them? Yes. Okay. Maybe three. Uh. I'm Chris Goldsmith. I work for Quality Staffing. And I, even though the, the bulk of my position is, is focused on business development, not a day goes by that I don't talk with a young person. I still do recruiting. I still talk to people, interview people. And I want to just shout out to our libraries because I want to tell you I'm very passionate about this. Not a single day goes by that I don't speak to someone about our libraries. And the reason why is because sometimes it's the only thing that I have to say to someone who is really struggling to learn and to get ahead and these are all different people of all different ages. So I thank the libraries for the work that they do because they help me do my job, which a lot of times is trying to change people's lives, make a difference in their lives. If you work in the staffing business, that's what we do. So I want to just say thank you to anyone who works and contributes to our libraries. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Taylor Johnson. I actually graduated from this campus three years ago in 2016. <laughs> and then I just got my bachelor's over at Salisbury University this past May. And Tim Dukes knows me, but I'm the current Miss Sussex County as well. I just came off my fourth and final year competing for Miss Delaware. One of the things I have noticed in this county in particular is that if you're not getting a job in criminal justice, education, or agriculture, you're not really gonna succeed in this county and to only have three fields in this county, which is still pretty big if you look at other states, that's pretty sad. As a communications major, I feel like at some point I'm gonna cap and there's no more room for personal growth and I think we need to expand any job that we can so there's more fields available in this area and then you won't have people 
who want to leave for a better opportunity. The better opportunity will be here. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to add here, I can't remember, I did a gentleman who said it over here, right? It's about how do we also find jobs in the county that will attract young people to stay, right? And so that it's more than just a job, but truly it's a, a career opportunity for them. Good morning, I'm Mike Nally. Uh, I am with the Board of Directors for Habitat for Humanity, and I would like to use Habitat as an example of uh, success in addressing social mobility in Sussex County. Habitat and there are many uh, board members here today, including Bobby and their staff members here today. And I just want to say thank you. Habitat promotes hope, builds homes, and creates communities. And it's also a model that helps leverage with a hand up, not a handout. So it creates confidence in these skills that change generations, creates hope and um, social mobility for families, and I would just like to say that is a shining example of success in Sussex County. And if you're interested, on November 13th, we have a Hope Builder breakfast at Dell Tech, so we invite you all right in this room, Bobby. So, thank you. So, yeah, it's a question to the right side, right? Other room, sorry. Hi, good morning. I'm Paulette Rapp. I'm the director of The Way Home. Uh, we work with the formerly incarcerated in reentry. And when you talk about social mobility, um, yes, all of the, the um, different factors that we've just discussed in terms of affordable housing and education, but one of the key ingredients of social mobility is to take the pulse of the community, mm -hmm. to find out the health and the mental and behavioral health going on. And in formerly incarcerated, which are pretty much on the lowest of the low in that social mobility ladder, um, Sussex County is starting to infuse more behavioral health resources, um, but I can tell you in this last month that they released 24 to homelessness. And so when, we, when Pat talked about um, the basic needs from Maslow, we need to look at those factors of how do we get um, those individuals who serve their time back into the community to, they are citizens, they've served their time, and um, what are the resources here, not only for those individuals, but go back to your seniors, um, in terms of medical resources and those specialists that are necessary to have and thrive in our more golden years. So I do think, like I said, a highlight is it's starting to come to Sussex, which is a good thing, um, but we are sorely behind and we really need it like yesterday. Thank you. One, it's one more, can we take one more um, comment? Uh, Lynn Betts from Seaford. I uh, just kind of wanted to piggyback. What we're hearing here is the greatest strength, and I've lived many places, I've been in this county for 30 years, the greatest strength here is the nonprofit organizations. If it was not for the nonprofits, we would really be hurting. Out of six kids that my husband and I have, the four with advanced degrees, none of them live in Sussex County. And the nonprofits, whether it's the Knights of Columbus, whether it's Habitat, The Way Home, Society of St. Vincent de Paul, Community Integrated Services, um, we have had to learn out of necessity the last five years that we can't keep fighting for the same pot of money. We have to work together. The Sussex County Health Coalition is a shining example of training for us, dealing with collective impact. We're working together. And if it wasn't for grant and aid and Sussex County Council grants, I don't know where we'd be right now. And that is a shining star in this county. Hey, I was going to make that my last comment. We got um, two more. We'll do the last two, because I think you hit a nerve for um, someone. So we want to make sure that they're heard. I'm the nerve that's been hit. <laughs> uh, I'm here with uh, Rosemary representing LRAC, the Lewis Rehoboth Association of Churches. This is an organization that touches so many lives, and yet we serve only the Cape Henelopen School District geographically. Housing needs, food, shelter, we have a 
major thrift store on Route 1, right behind the Jiffy Lube, that uh, provides us many dollars that go directly to the community. But what I want to share is uh, not from me personally or my organization, but I'm curious to know if anyone is here from First State. Mm -hmm. I would love for you to sing your praises. I'll do it for you, but I'd rather have you do it. Thank you. You guys. I would sing your praises too, right? They are a phenomenal partner, but you go ahead. <laughs> Good morning. Um, my name's Bruce Wright. I'm a program manager at First State Community Action Agency. Um, forgive me for not standing. Um, so we're a social service agency with um, a deep connection to a network that's 1,100 wide across the country. Um, we provide services from youth to adult. But I've been sitting here and listening to the conversations that you have, and I think one of our strengths is um, relying on people like you in the room, but we also rely on the clients and the people that we're trying to serve. Mm -hmm. So the most important thing that we do is we get out, we interview, and we talk to those individuals that we provide services to to find out what their real barriers are, what their strengths are, and what supports they need. And I think if we spend more time collectively doing that and talking to them, I mean, we spend a lot of time talking about young people. You know, I'm older, you can look at me, I'm gray hair now, losing the <laughs> hair. But I surrounded myself with a team of people that are mixed age and diversity, and the products that we produce are greater because we all, all bring different experiences, and that just makes us better. Sussex County has gone through the same transition over the years that I've been here for almost 30 years, and we have to engage those different diverse groups and get them in the room, young people, old people, Latino community, African American community, white community, and talk about what our needs and our barriers are and complement one another and make change. Thank you. One last comment. If someone had their hand up. Does she still want to say something? Yeah, no? Okay. So I'm going to close out just because I want to keep us on time. I want to be respectful. It's about like she's winking at me. Um, so um, I'm going to use the time to close out on, um, to say a couple of things. One is I can't close without um, saying this. How many in the room by show of hands um, has heard of 211? Some, but not many. Okay. So 211 is the state's information and referral network. Um, in Delaware, we take about 100,000 calls a day. So, you know, if you have a, a medical emergency, you dial what? 911. But if you have a health and human services emergency, you dial 211. And so 211 is um, part of United Way of Delaware. Um, we have a team that um, um, works every day, all day. And in Sussex, we take a little bit about, I think, about um, 25, about 25,000 calls a year from people who need immediate services. So usually when people are calling, their light's about to get cut off on Friday, I'm about to be evicted, I'm homeless, I'm living in my car, um, I took a call, I have a voucher, I'm staying in a hotel, but my vouchers are about to run out, I need housing, and I can't find somewhere who will take my voucher with my four kids. And so I just wanted to make sure, I got to do the plug because a lot of times people don't know that 211 exists in the state and we got to do a better job of making sure for the individuals that you serve, um, that the and then when they are in crisis, that is like the best first go-to, right, to try to be able to connect them. And we're proud that we created a new partnership with Department of Health and Human Services so that if we can't help them, meaning if United Way, if, if there's a call we can't take, we're going to deploy them to Department of Health and Human Services, and they're going to put boots on the ground and actually try to go touch them wherever they are to try to connect them to services. So we have just started that in the last 30 days, so I want to say a plug. I also want to say a plug, one of the best practices, one of the best, best practices on the social mobility ladder, I believe that exists, is Stand By Me. I know that we are a partner, Delaware Tech is a partner with us, and maybe some other people in the um, room. But with, through the Stand By Me, specifically in Sussex County, we've helped over 2,500 families um, create budgets, stick to them. Um, a little more than 1,600 of them actually have um, improved their credit scores, have increased savings, have reduced debt. A little more than 200 of them have actually purchased homes right here in the state, so we're proud of that. And we think the value of those homes collectively is about $2.8 million. 
Um, so it's sewing back into the economy. And that's not, we're trying to get an economic um, study of that, right? Because that's just the cost of the home. But what we're saying is that's not the cost of the mortgage. So by the time they pay that off in 30 years, right? What's the real value of that? What, how much did the um, realtors make off of this, right? And how much actually got sold back in the economy? What happens when they had to go to Lowe's or Home Depot or Walmart or wherever to get things, right? So we are intentionally partnering with organizations like Delaware Tech to try to get more young people from the gate, from the beginning, when they are still in college, to start thinking about how do they move from where they are to where they want to be able to get to. So I have to do a plug for that. And then I would like to close you with this quote, right? So I'm about action. I feel like in my part of my career, um, I've been working really hard to try to create change. Some days um, I take two steps forward. Some days I feel like I take three steps back. Um, but I am at the point now that says I'm really serious. I wake up every morning. I'm so passionate about making a difference in the lives of people in our community. I'm so passionate of speaking on behalf and helping people find their voice when kids cannot read by the end of third grade. Like if you just read the stats and says where kids are by third grade is an indicator where they're finished up, then I don't know why we're not louder about these third grade reading scores. Or why do we get surprised 10 years later when we have the impact we have on our economy, when the unemployment rate is so high, when the homeless rates doubles, right? It all started back when they were in third grade, right? I wanna be able to work with great partners like you in the room to ensure that we have really build and create a workforce that you need for tomorrow. But I also at the point where it says, look, I gotta challenge myself and my team every day of the definition of insanity. If, if I'm just going to do the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results, I keep this up of just about, uh, Mark knows this, I put it up at board meetings, I put it up my staff meetings, I put it up just to remind myself in my office that if I'm just going to do the same thing, why do I expect different results? So my challenge to you this morning as you go out and sit in your sessions, the fourth goal, right, of this conference is about action, right? And I would try to challenge you to remember, how do we get better collective action? And then think about what are we going to do different, right? What can we do different, right? So that when we actually sit here a year from now, we can come back in this room and talk about because of this conference now and the work that we've done over the last year and the different actions that we've taken, here's how many more people in this county have moved up because of us, the collective we. Thank you. I don't know about you guys, but I wrote down collective impact. I keep saying it over and over in my head. I love that, and I think that's um, um, really what this county should be able to do, is to have a collective impact. We're doing it, but as, as Michelle said, you know, we can always do better. Um, so thank you again, Michelle, for being with us and really helping us think deeper about this really important topic, and thanks for highlighting the fourth goal, take action, I love that. Um, so remember, the planning team really listened to your feedback from last year, and so we changed the agenda a little this year. So after our break, we will have our breakout sessions. So that's different than in the past. Each session will provide attendees with a model or a tool that will equip each of us to what? Take action uh, for our county and our state. So now here are the breakout instructions. Um, you will do two 45-minute breakout sessions. Yes, they are longer this year. Feedback from all of you. You're going to choose two from the four workshops listed on the screen. And how, I love it, planning team, great job, because the, everything you guys said just a couple minutes ago, affordable housing, yep, it's on there. Transportation, yep, it's on there. Education and training, it's on there and workforce, it's on there. So breakout sessions um, are going to be great. Um, if you, don't, don't worry about not getting to all of them, because the other thing we did differently this year is instead of bringing in a totally different panel, our breakout session presenters are going to be our panel at the end. So that allows you uh, to come back and ask some questions. Um, 
maybe you were in the session and you had a question you didn't get answered, you can answer or ask it then. Or if you weren't in the session, you will be able to ask some questions about those key topics. So you see those on the screen there. Um, you're going to have um, a little, about 10, 12 minutes uh, to switch uh, over to the workshop. You'll have 15 minutes in between. I need you guys to be back in your seats in here by 11.30, if you will, because that's when our panelists will be back here and we'll end our morning uh, with our panelists and then our closing remarks um, from Secretary Cade. So um, I'm trusting you that you're gonna get to your first breakout by 9.30, okay? I don't wanna have to come around the hallways with the cowbell. So I'll see you guys back here at 11.30. So how were the breakout sessions? Good? Awesome. Well, after I told you all not to stress over which session to go to, I had a little stress over which sessions to go to. And I was going around and apologizing to the other presenters because I wasn't in their session because um, the topics are just so great. Um, and so again, this year, the planning team, thank you for your good thinking and helping us kind of reimagine the conference a little bit in its 26th year. Um, thank you for bringing together some great topics. Um, so what we said, remember, was that we weren't gonna bring in a whole new panelist. We were gonna bring our breakout pre presenters to the stage so you all could do some Q&A with them. You may have been in their session and didn't get a chance to ask the question. You may have been in their session and you went to the next session and then you thought, I should have asked about that in the last session. Um, or maybe you weren't in their session at all, like me, and I have some questions, but I'll let you guys go first, um, for those sessions that I didn't go to. Okay, so this is really a great opportunity for some dialogue. We've heard from you in surveys. We want more discussion time. We want more group dialogue, so I hope we're giving that to you this year. Um, so to get started, I'm just gonna ask each panelist uh, to give us their name and their affiliation or who they're with. Um, and then we have four people running around the room with microphones, and we're just gonna go with it for questions. You raise your hand, okay? Keep it pretty, pretty simple, all right? So we'll start with this big guy over here. I said, only, I said, only in Delaware can I tell a secretary to just sit down and wait till I tell him to start. And he's like, that's the way it always is, so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Saran Cade, uh, Delaware Department of Labor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Lisa Wheeler, Citadel Concepts. Hi, my name is Tyler Burrell. I am uh, from Housing Alliance Delaware. I'm the manager of Community Development Advocacy. I'm Rachel Turney. I'm also from the Delaware Department of Labor, but specifically from the Division of Employment and Training. I'm Erin Willis. Whoa, that's really loud. And I'm with Sun Behavioral. And I'm Kevin Bronsky, I'm Human Resources for Mount Air Farms. All right, let's welcome our panelists. Okay, who wants to ask the first question? Who has a question? All right, let's get a mic to you, Denise. You, you might though. <laughs> Anybody want to take that question? Yeah. Tyler? Hi, Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> I think they know each other, so Sussex County. Um, so one of the biggest issues in Sussex County, as you're speaking about, is, um, is providing services to immigrant populations. Um, and particularly in the housing space, um, what we find is that we have landlords that take advantage of individuals because they don't have that, that immigrant status. Um, and so uh, this was largely addressed in our analysis of, so the state uh, just put out what's called an analysis of impediments to fair housing. How do you get people, how, um, how do you uh, make sure everyone has equal access to fair housing? Um, and 
And so what we find is that this is truly a, a fair housing issue when landlords discriminate uh, by base of, of national origin. And what we find is that the only way to really address this issue is by having more state level um, um, litigation about these fair housing issues. We need our social service providers like, uh, like First State Community Action Agency who do such a fantastic job with our communities to, uh, to, to highlight this issue um, as a real issue and then talk to the Division of Human Relations um, to really address this as a fair housing issue, understanding that, um, that immigrants with housing issues also have rights. Anybody else in the panel want to address that? I can, uh, from a Mount Air Farms uh, perspective, we have uh, partners, partnerships with different churches. Um, the Haitian community is a big community for Sussex County. And from what they're telling me in the HR, on the HR side, is that they need more um, classes with it, dealing with English. Uh, I think that is the number one thing and we will continue to uh, try to partnership with those churches to provide that kind of education for, for the, the service for the people. I'll just add Rachel, one thing. do you want to add something? Go ahead. Yeah, is Linda Eklund here? Just to call her out. Oh. <laughs> so I, I call Linda out real quick because Linda Eklund is over at Sussex Tech and um, I will get her title wrong, but essentially is responsible for adult education and English language learning learning um, programs fall under her. And I think uh, one thing that the Department of Labor is doing in partnership with Sussex Tech is figuring out how we can couple English language learning um, programs or, and skills with an occupational focus so that the individual, um, is the learning is contextualized and there's, there's m meaning behind learning the English language with an occupational skill. And we've done some of that work um, focusing on electricians at Sussex Tech um, under the Say it again. Welders. Yeah. So uh, we we branch out into what we're calling pre-apprenticeship. Um, this is the type of activity that we're looking to continue to fund. So far with that Sussex Tech, um, we work directly with Linda. She's the principal of Groves. I'm the industrial training coordinator. So I oversee all the apprenticeship programs, um, the traditionals like plumbing. HVAC electrical and how we work with the Spanish community is um, Linda has developed a really cool system where she has um, got funding from the Department of Labor, Department of Education and she takes English language learners and she in integrates them into our programs and if um, there's, there's a language barrier between the instructor and say a Spanish student we have um, bridged that gap with translators when, when the translators will come in and they'll sit in class and then the English lang language learners will have an opportunity to have a third class where the translator can um, re-deliver the material. And what's really cool is that these are pathways that the Spanish communities um, can use to um, learn a skilled trade and then ultimately um, we find them jobs. And we were super successful last year in our welding program. Um, we had a, a few guys come in um, learn um, English and then find jobs in the welding um, industry. So if you're interested in learning more about that, come see me after everything. So. Great. Thank you. All right. Good, good question to start us off. Great supports in the community that we're learning about. Um, who, has, who else has a question? I'm sure there's some. Tina Downs. When we talk about mobility, um, I watch every day as people are trying to get from the western side of the county to the eastern side and all of the traffic. And then I see these buses, DART buses driving around with hardly any people on them. So my question is, are, is DART really sitting there and analyzing the needs? Um, I also ride by Route 5 and 9 where um, Alan Harim is. And I'm watching the, the employees walk all along Route 9 to get to this bus stop that is so far away from the plant. So I just wonder what is the thought process of where the stops are, how they connect, so that we can get people where they need to go quickly. Because a lot of times I hear people say, well, it takes you know, two hours to get somewhere if you take the buses. So 
Anybody here from DART or that wants to admit that they're from so, DART? <laughs> so we found the lady from DART. She was in our last breakout session, right? <laughs> and uh, oh, here she is. But we did talk about this in the transportation breakout session. Yeah, so did. I don't know. Um, we can have some um, immediate feedback from our friends at DART. But we have a plan, right? Because we're taking action. Didn't yep. we decide that in our last session? Yeah, go ahead. Hello, my name is Trey Meek the Cherry Wall, and I am the planner for Sussex County. And we are actually looking at revamping all of the DART bus routes in Sussex County. <laughs> and with that, we're going to be restarting our Sussex Working Group meeting. So if anybody wants to be a part of it, mm -hmm. you can let Bobby know, and mm -hmm. she'll forward your information to me. Um, but as far as the bus stops, there is a criteria because whenever we put in a bus stop, it does have to meet ADA criteria. Right. And the bus stop that you've seen on 9 and 5, when you've seen people walking, it was a temporary bus stop because they was doing construction right there. And during construction, we can't have people just in the mix of that. And with that whole intersection being as crowded, busy as it is, we wouldn't want to put more people in the mix of that as it was with buses stopping and everything. Um, our bus stop has been reestablished. Um, it is up right in front of the graveyard, like on the corner there. So you won't see them walking for miles and miles down there. So that's one of the things that's coming from DART. Ke Kevin, did you or Aaron want to say anything? So um, in our breakout session, we, we did collaborate and we will be working with, with uh, DART to try mm -hmm. to come up with a, a better plan. Uh, this is about action, um, and in the breakout sessions, the diversity that we had, uh, it was easy to come up with a plan because that is the long-term solution, and we're going to work with DART. Mm -hmm. Great. Another question over here. Hi, good morning. This is my first year attending, so I just want to say that this has been so informational and inspiring, really. Thank you. Well, welcome. Thank you. So I do have a couple of different perspectives. Um, I am with resort broadcasting company WGMD. So between Jennifer and I, we actually manage over seven, 75 accounts um, for advertising with all small business owners in this area. So, um, and, that's just the two of us. and it's the two of us. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of interaction with our accounts and um, it's not just about the ads that they're running, but the business itself. And we encounter so much about hiring and the struggle of hiring and retaining employees. So we actually went to both of the Department of Labor um, sessions here, and I was really um, impressed with all the opportunities, especially from, is it Rachel, um, and, and everything that they offer through the Department of Labor. Um, my fiance also just started a company recently, and um, I guess my question would be, we get a lot of mail on workers' comp and rules and regulations from the Department of Labor. Um, I would love to get, maybe not mail, but maybe more marketing and influence on the opportunities from the Department of Labor. Um, I'm sure there's websites and things like that, but I'm more interested in how can we be a resource to, not just my fiance, but to all of our 75 clients that are looking to hire? Can they be more involved in what you have to offer? Or are you kind of maxed out um, on what you can offer right now. Are there a lot of people that are still looking for jobs in certain trades? Because we work with a lot of service industries. So, so I'll take that one. Um, so for one, I'm glad that you got some uh, uh, good information from Rachel's session. Uh, I typically have sessions in our office with Rachel and I feel the exact same way. Uh, <laughs> explains all of those good things that, that we're doing. Uh, a part of that is, uh, of what you're talking about, is really kind of changing uh, the way the Department of Labor looks at itself and the way you guys see us. Um, in the past, uh, I, I took this, this job in January of 18, and as an agency, we didn't have a communications team as an agency. Um, so, you know, and a part of that was how we saw ourselves. I don't think we as an agency, maybe employment and training did, but as an agency, I don't think we saw ourselves as a resource. I think we only saw ourselves as a regulatory entity that was responsible for making sure that you got your workers' compensation, which we want you to have. Make sure you do that. <laughs> that hasn't changed. 
um, or as the unemployment office, uh, or, or you know, levying unemployment taxes, all those other things. So um, what we have done now is we have established a communications team. We've put together a communications plan so that we can better market the services that we have, so that our, our service providers as well as employers can view us as a resource uh, rather than as some type of threatening. Uh, entity. So, you know, we want people to have a different feeling when we knock on the door and say we're the Department of Labor and we're here um, uh, to, 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 to talk to you. Um, uh, uh, right now, you get, you know, we, we may not get you to answer the door uh, when we do that, but hopefully as we begin to get more word out as to the things that we're doing in employment and training, the resources that we also have at Vocational Rehabilitation, which I know some of you uh, work with DVR as well, trying to help individuals who are dealing with significant uh, disabilities connect with job opportunities. Um, we, we'd love to make sure that we can get that information out to you in, a, in, a, in an easily uh, digestible format. Also, when you start talking about getting a better understanding of your, your local economy in the marketplace, uh, our Office of Occupational Labor Market Information uh, works very closely with our schools, but we could probably work a heck of a lot, and so we work very closely with Dell Tech and with our K-12 system, and especially our Votech. Uh, schools to make sure that they're constantly aware of growing industries, growing fields, and the needs that are in there. Uh, we would love to work more closely with nonprofit organizations and community groups uh, as well to make sure that you get access to that data that we release and um, on a monthly basis when you start talking about just unemployment data, but more specifically, we get really granular uh, into the opportunities that are available for our, our workforce. So. Uh, if we can work in a, in a more collaborative way to get that information out, we're going to continue to do it. And Secretary, we put that link on the Sussex County Today and Tomorrow Conference website, too, for everyone that's here, so they can get right into that data. So Already happening, see? See? Yeah, we got this. We got this. Very good. Any, Rachel, did you want to add anything? Well said. Oh, good. Okay, good. All right, uh, another question. We have about 10 more minutes for Q&A, so another question? Okay. Uh, my name is Kevin Gilmore, and Tyler, I appreciated your session about housing, affordable housing, and you did a really good job at uh, sharing the picture, sort of the history, uh, and and letting us realize around the, you know that there is housing discrimination still in the United States, and there's a there's a past that has led us to this place, uh, and there's also housing inequality, income inequality through housing. Um, and I think that most of us understand that that exists. Um, and I think really what I'm looking for are ideas on how to change that narrative from uh, the lack of affordable housing being a problem of those who don't have it or income inequality being of those who are lower income. And how do we make it, uh, how do we talk about it for what it really is and it's a societal problem? And how are we connecting it to transportation? How are we connecting it to, uh, to job creation? Um, and looking at it as an issue that affects all of us. Anybody can answer the ideas on that. It looks like Tyler's going for the mic. Sure. Slowly, okay. but he's going. All right, I can do this, guys. I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I completely agree with you. I think, uh, particularly when we talk to our elected officials, our administration officials, um, and, and oftentimes, a lot of times when we talk to our business community as well, when we start talking about our, our shortages in housing, when we talk about housing costs, when we talk about, um, about how many units we need to develop, we, we, we get eyes glossed over immediately. Um, and I, and I, think, um, I think a lot of the times that is because we, we lose that human picture. Um, so I would first start off by, by saying that we as our nonprofit housing sector doesn't good, do a good job uh, of broadcasting our clients' needs, our clients' stories, um, and connecting that to the w wider community. But, um, but more on a larger point, I, I think all the research shows um, that if we can start um, getting out of a perspective on consumerism, that um, that you know what that person doesn't deserve to to have housing because in this area because they can't afford it because they're not working hard enough. If we can get out of the idea of consumerism and start talking about um, about our community benefits, if we talk, start talking about um, how our entire community um, is improved by having 
um, that diverse uh, that diverse workforce, that diverse community, that um, diversity in incomes, um, collectively together under one roof. If we can start talking about uh, benefits to the entire community, then we can start making progress that uh, dollars and cents or units uh, particularly um, don't don't make very well. Um, now, I must also admit that I, as a, an affordable housing advocate, um, haven't done a, a good job doing that, and I haven't quite figured out that, uh, the, that uh, equation quite right as of yet, and so it's something that we, we all need to work on. Yeah, yeah. I am. Um, I have less of a question and more of maybe just a couple statements. Um, to, I as well, this is my very first time visiting, and I'm um, Sandy Baynard, HR Director at CHEER, um, and this has just been a wonderful opportunity for me to network and meet people. Um, when I attended the transportation um, session, I know one of the things that most nonprofits here probably pride ourselves on is grant aid, you know, going out and trying to get funding and money from all the different states, agencies, et cetera. And I know that was something that didn't come up. And you talked about the liability of having your bigger bus and trying to scale down to your vans and uh, such. And I know Carolyn earlier spoke about us having a fleet of vans, a fleet of transportation. Definitely think about that, and if you ever need some advice, feel free to reach out to us at CHEER. And um, Sharon, when you mentioned the Department of Labor working with nonprofits, well, you have a wonderful team that started working with us, Dawn, Todd, Josh, invite me to all the job fairs, and I've been out there a lot, and I really appreciate having that team and want to learn more from them. But Rachel today also enlightened me to, I never, the procurement in the Department of Labor, I would have never thought there was such a thing. So I think that was also a wonderful um, session that she had. Get the message out, <laughs> right, right. We're looking at this holistically, right? How, how can we uh, have an ultimate focus on our goal of connecting people with job opportunities and the skills that they need? That's not just through our programming. We've got to walk the walk ourselves, so we've got to make sure that we're hiring and contracting mm -hmm. with organizations to provide services to our agency that are you know, focused on those same goals. Uh, we have to make sure that we're giving opportunities to local businesses who are hiring locally so that they can spur the economy uh, in that manner. So it's not just our programming, it's our, our actions, it's what we're doing uh, and how we can kind of get the most bang for our, you know, uh, uh, limited resources. I'm looking at some of my elected officials out here. <laughs> limited resources, <laughs> I'm not, I, I don't, uh, we, you know, we're not, we're, we're, we're not, you know, out here spending like crazy. Uh, we recognize that. But um, there are things that we can do with every single cent that we get to move the needle, and that's what we're looking to do. Uh, John Riley, Sussex County Council, and um, I just wanted to make a quick comment. Um, I mentioned this in the breakout section on uh, affordable housing, but some of you may know, some may not. Uh, this council has uh, had a consultant working for the last six months developing a study and a proposal on the topic of affordable housing, because we do recognize it as, as an issue. And uh, so yesterday at council, we had our presentation. What I wanted to make sure you knew is that on the county website, there is a link. Um, if nothing else, you can find it through the agenda um, for yesterday that has the entire slide presentation for um, yesterday's presentation. And it's pretty, pretty instructive. It's not the final form in all its full detail, but it, it, it's going to get you 90% of it. And essentially, the, it outlines the, the issue, and it highlights particularly three, potentially more, but at least three primary solutions. And um, one of them revolves around offering increased density in exchange for some housing uh, units that are offered at um, below market rates. It's entirely voluntary, entirely market driven, and I believe that's what's going to make it sustainable. Um, also. Uh, putting more money into, we have a department that helps with um, low-income um, housing, making funds available for rehab, and so maintaining our existing stock. And then the third one would be uh, potentially creating a pool of money that would be utilized um, to assist with potentially um, uh, projects that may not otherwise be economically viable, <laughs> say it that way. Um, so there's, we're talking about it. And I want you to make sure that you get on the, the website and, and look at that if you have interest. Um, there's some good information there, and we welcome feedback. Thanks, John. John, would it be okay if we pulled that link and put it on the county conference website? So, off the. So you want to 
Okay, great. So we'll we'll have our marketing team do that after today. We'll get that link there too. Not that you can't find it on the county's website, but we're having the conversation here. So if you can come to the Sussex County uh, Today and Tomorrow Conference website, we'll try to do a one-stop shop for us. Give, give us a, a day or so to get those links on there, but we'll, we'll make sure we do that. I think we have time for one more question before, oh, look, the hand is up. So this is our last question for the panel. <laughs> you don't have to run, it's okay. <laughs> when I hear the term market-driven and therein sustainable, I don't like the sound of that as it <laughs> applies to affordable housing. Um, consumer driven, meeting the needs of those people who need affordable housing. If we as a county, if we as a state provide that, we're gonna have healthier families, we're gonna have people who are more eligible for gainful employment. That is what I need to hear. And I think that Mr. Burl touched on that. It can't be the same old, same old. It can't be proposals that we can visit. We've got to come up with better remedies than this. And I say, Sussex County, you can do so much better. So that sounds like a call to action to me. Goal number four on the website, check it out. Um, I wanna, let's thank the panelists again, not only for being panelists, but doing breakout sessions and the panelists, double duty, thank you. So panelists, all but the secretary, you guys can head back to your seats. And then I get to, I get to introduce him. I told him he had to stay seated, seated. He can't do what my president does to me and push me off the stage, Dr. Brainerd. <laughs> my introduction to Mark gets shorter and shorter and shorter. Soon I'm just gonna say, here's Mark at our next event. But um, it is my pleasure to introduce the Honorable Saran Cade to provide our closing remarks today. As Delaware's Secretary of Labor, he leads efforts to promote a talented and diverse workforce while protecting the rights of workers throughout the state. Prior to his role at the Delaware Department of Labor, Secretary Cade serves as the, served as the acting director of DEDO, where he managed the department's dissolution and subsequent creation of its successor, the Division of Small Business. Secretary Cade served as the division's first director, leading state initiatives to attract businesses, tourists, and well-paying jobs to Delaware. Please join me in welcoming Saran Cade, our Secretary of Labor. Thank you, thank you. Um, one, I wanna thank uh, Dell Tech uh, for uh, hosting this event, you know. Um, Incredibly important, incredibly important. Um, they stayed on top of me throughout the week, constantly wanting to do like conference calls. Yeah, you know, I don't know if it was because they were worried about what I was gonna say or not, but um, I couldn't get on the last conference call that we had because I had a scare with my daughters. I was picking them up from the bus stop, but they didn't get off the bus, they were fine. Um, but I missed the call and I was like, man, they probably think that I'm like gonna go all in in this conversation. Um, but, uh, but, I, um, but I, 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 I want to say that I told them that, yeah, I got my remarks. I'm perfectly fine. I don't need anything. And it was all because I just didn't prepare them. And, um, and I didn't want them to worry about that. Um, but, uh, but I want to thank you guys for all of the work that you've done to put this on and the continued work that we do as our you know, biggest training provider. Uh, in the in the state and um, the work that you constantly do to help our businesses, but mostly our workforce and the people who are here, um, you do amazing work. So thank you. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Saran Cade. I have the pleasure of greeting you as our Secretary of Labor. Uh, for the folks who came to our uh, 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 sessions, I got to say that I tried my hardest like to make sure that I didn't add stuff that I was going to say in this conversation during the session, I failed miserably. So if you, if you hear redundant things, you know, laugh and clap anyway, and <laughs> it'll just make this go a lot easier. Um, but I, I wanna say that um, a lot of times when government officials come and greet you, uh, sometimes they, you know, talk about how hard the job is and how much of a struggle it is. 
um, and, and, and you know, you start to think like, man, maybe they just don't want to do that. Um, I will tell you that I am the exact opposite. I love what I do. Uh, I love the job that I have, uh, the fact that I get to wake up every day and uh, provide services to individuals to help connect them with job opportunities, improve their lives, improve the lives uh, and the opportunities of their family. And I get to work with an amazing group of people at the Department of Labor. I'd like for your folks at the Department of Labor who work there to stand, please. Stand. There we go. Thank you, guys. Um, I get the pleasure of showing up to work every day with people who are dedicated to making sure that the citizens of this state have access to all the opportunities that they need to be successful. Also have the pleasure of working with a group of people who do not hesitate uh, to tell me when I got it wrong or, you know, to keep me on track and all those other things. And it's greatly appreciated uh, the work that they do. Um, we have a, a belief at the Department of Labor that uh, the greatest social program that exists is a good paying job. Uh, not only because it adds to people's bank accounts, but because it adds to people's lives, it adds to people's opportunities, it strengthens our families and our strong families strengthen our communities, and we can't have a strong state and economy unless we have those building blocks in place, those strong communities. So we definitely recognize that. Um, I'm gonna start out real quick, and I know I don't have much time, uh, with a, a, one of my favorite uh, uh, parables, uh, David versus Goliath. Not because I look like Goliath, but uh, more because of the story itself. We all know the story, so I won't really get too deep into the, you know, this happened and then that happened. Uh, we all know that David stood up to fight Goliath and uh, uh, pulled out a slingshot and beat him and won. And it's the old story of how the little guy can triumph over the big guy. I was never that guy in school who only read the surface level of the story. I take way too much time sometimes analyzing things. And over the years of analyzing David and Goliath, I'd actually come to the realization that it was less about war um, and more about tactics and strategies. Um, if you remember the story of David and Goliath, David actually, when he first stood up to fight Goliath, the uh, king said, okay, David, I'll give you my armor, I'll give you my sword so that you can slay this giant. And so David, you know, tried to put on the armor and tried to lift the sword. It was all way too heavy uh, for him. And, you know, David said to himself, you know, I'm not a soldier. I am, you know, a shepherd. And that's when he pulled out his slingshot. And next thing on Sports Center, David beats Goliath. <laughs> it's a rout, it's a blowout, and he's successful. Um, I think about that all the time when I think about the competition that we experience, where it almost seems like we're David in a lot of regards, whether you're talking about the state of Delaware as a whole or Sussex County, where we're David and it's a whole lot of Goliaths out there that we're competing with. The Maryland's, the Pennsylvania's, the Virginia's of the world, global uh, 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 centers of, of, of development and business. And the question becomes, how are we going to be successful in that environment, in that type of competitive environment. And I would say it's a combination of two things. It's a very nuanced approach. So you're gonna have to think very deeply about this just as much as I thought about that David and Goliath story. It's a very nuanced approach. First, Charles Darwin said that the most successful species are not the strongest, are not the, bright, the, the most intelligent, but those who are best able to adapt to changing times and environments. We have to be able to adapt. That's one. David was able to adapt to the fact that he wasn't fighting off wolves. He was fighting off a giant. So he had to adapt his, his, his tactic as to how he was going to address that. However, when he adapted his tactic, he remembered one thing, which we have to remember, what we're good at. Just because you're adapting to a changing environment doesn't mean that you throw away the things that you're good at. David was good at using his slingshot. And so David was able to slay Goliath with that slingshot. Now, whether or not that's a real story or not, we're going to act like it's a real story today, and we're going to go with it. Because the things that I would argue with you that Delaware does incredibly well, we are a very small state. Therefore, we have the ability to wrap our arms around people, 
around industries, and we have done it for centuries. Whether we're talking about the chemical industry in our state, where we, had the, where we wrapped our arms around that entire industry and it still bears fruit today, uh, making sure that we created policies and generated a workforce that, that, that the chemical industry could use. And even though DuPont is no longer as large as it is, we still benefit every day from the workforce that DuPont left behind, those thousands of PhDs who are being scooped up by new and growing companies like Insight and other chemical companies up and down the state. We have wrapped our arms around the corporations industry and become the number one state and the number one entity across the globe at attracting individuals and corporations to incorporate right here in the state of Delaware. We made the adjustments to ensure that we are an open arms state when it comes to agriculture uh, and have done so and now agriculture is continuously over the last you know, hundreds of years the top three industry in our state consistently and top and 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 we've done it with financial services where now 40,000 individuals in the state of Delaware are work for a financial services company so we've done this before what's the new and emerging industry of our future it's very easy to say it's IT very easy to say that it's virtual reality or AI but I would argue with you that the number one industry of the future is talent. How do we grow it? How do we retain it? How do we recruit it? People, the skills that individuals have that are gonna make them a value added to any company or any industry who seeks to establish themselves within our borders. That is what we have to wrap our arms around over the next you know, half century. How do we develop the skills of the individuals that are necessary for them to be successful in the workforce? Not just the skills that are necessary for a specific company, but the skills that are necessary for the industry. How do we make them adaptable to numerous industries that are looking to grow? And that's the work that we're doing and that we've been doing at the Department of Labor. For starters, we said, how do we grow talent? Well, I end up as I said, and I'm in one of those positions where I don't get to stay in my lane. My lane grows, and I don't know if that's because it's, that's the way it's supposed to be or that's just my personality. Um, but regardless, let's just act like it's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, I, I find myself in schools more often. Um, in some of those schools, I find myself in middle schools where people aren't even of working age yet because you can't talk to the farmer about the harvest until you talk to him about the planting and all the irrigation work that goes into ensuring that you have a bountiful harvest once it comes time, uh, uh, that time of the season. So I do a lot of work in our schools. Uh, work, I was visiting uh, middle school yesterday up in Newcastle um, and having a conversation. And I've been having these conversations with some of our middle schools because we have to begin to adapt our school system to the new and emerging economy of our future. That isn't something that's new. We've done that for hundreds of years. As you all know, the schedule of our schools is built around the agriculture economy. We're off in the summertime so that you could harvest and then send the kids back in September. We uh, uh, are, the, the way the classrooms operate and the way the schools operate are built around the industrial area. Think about it. You get up, you go into the school, bell rings, school day starts, you go to work all, you know, for four hours in school, you stop for lunch, pick up again, finish the day out until the bell rings again. It's all set up for our industrial era, uh, age. So we've been building our education system around an economy for centuries, but we can't stop. The economy is consistently changing. So when I go to all these schools, I highlight the things that our kids need that the current structure isn't really helping them to adapt to. One, they have to be adaptable. They have to be able to adapt to new and changing circumstances. So we've got schools that are focused on not really having such a rigid, rigidly scheduled work day. Yeah, you gotta get there at a certain time and all those other things, but 
it's not as predictable as school was when I was there, where you know at three o'clock every Thursday you're gonna be in Mrs. Johnson's literature class learning about Beowulf. <laughs> it was it's, 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 it's not gonna be that simple. The workforce is in need of problem solvers, people who are able to uh, think on their feet. They're in search of folks who are able to work in collaborative groups. So you know. We have to work on in schools more group projects, more projects that are based on project-based uh, learning rather than just subject matter uh, areas, but programs that, fo that focus on building social communication skills so that kids can provide the presentations and uh, other types of communication that's necessary in this changing environment. We need to build in systems that allow for kids to have agency because employers today very few of them punch clocks anymore. They expect you to be there because that's what you're supposed to be. That's where you're supposed to be. And they expect you to be there because we've got work to do. And so we have to make sure that kids have that level of agency so they can accomplish those goals. The second area of growing, uh, uh, outside of growing, becomes retaining talent. So yeah, we've got to grow talent. And we're going to depend on our K-12 system. We're going to depend on Dell Tech. We're going to depend on all of our other universities to help us grow that necessary talent whether it be those social emotional skills that I was talking about or whether it be the vocational skills that are necessary to bridge the skills divide of our workforce. That's going to be necessary. But we also have to retain our talent. One of the sectors of our workforce that we forget constantly are the people who have jobs. We rarely talk about the people who are working. We still have a mindset that someone's going to walk into the workforce at 21 and do the same job until they're 62 or 65 and that they're going to retire at that age and go on and, you know, live the rest of their life. That isn't happening. People transition now from job to job and career to career. So how do we support individuals who are currently in the workforce who may not necessarily be making enough to sustain a great quality of life, but they're ready and willing to learn more, but they can't stop working because they have responsibilities. This population is constantly forgotten. In fact, the majority of our resources that are available are for individuals who are unemployed or, uh, uh, or dislocated from their job or underemployed. But there are a lot of people out there who aren't underemployed and working 40 hours a week who could be doing something different and could be doing something more for their own social mobility. But the resources available are all, all mostly targeted to individuals who are currently out of work. And a lot of our training programs are generated for individuals who are out of work, can go to a training program for three months, not be paid, and spit out into a great job opportunity. We have to rethink who our demographic that we're focused on is, because I would argue with you that a good chunk of those individuals at the next recession are going to have a harder time getting back into the workforce if we don't provide them with the skills that they need right now while they're in, at, at, their, at their job. One of the things that we're focused on as well is something that I don't think we've, you know, it's, it's a debate, I'll put it that way. It's, it's, it's up for debate. Uh, uh, and, but my position has been that there are industries in our state and across the economy that governments have kind of turned a blind eye to uh, for numerous reasons which are definitely understandable. Um, one of those industries is our hospitality and food services industry. Uh, there has been a common refrain that these industries are low paying, that there's a lot of high, there's a, that there's high turnover, and that they're not really worthy of the level of public investment as industries that are providing more long-term, higher paying job opportunities. I understand that. Let me ask a show of hands. How many people here started, work, started their work career in the food services or hospitality industry? Raise your hand. That is almost 80% of the room. The food services and hospitality industry is not some industry off to its own. It is the internship for our entire workforce. When I talk to folks from J.P. Morgan Chase and all of these large Fortune 500 companies, and I ask them about the background of their managers, the first thing they tell me is, well, you know, I got guys out of food services who used to work at, you know, this restaurant. Or they tell me, I got a lady who's, you know, terrific, and she used to, you know, be a manager at Shoney's. Um, I'm aging myself at Shoney's. Um, 
But it stands out that that industry ends up spitting out majority of the workforce that we have. So why not use that industry as a facilitator for training and services and upskilling opportunities, knowing that the turnover is already high, so these folks are gonna be spilling out into new industries, using those industries as places to direct our services and some of our upskilling and training uh, uh, services. Looking at IT as though it is not a separate track. How many people were in school and had keyboarding class? All right, I'm aging myself too, because I had keyboarding class. <laughs> keyboarding class, right? They talked about keyboarding class as if it was a separate subject. You will only need to know keyboarding if you become a secretary. Keyboarding is a separate thing. It's on our secretary track. You learn keyboarding, you'll be a secretary who can type up 22 words a second or whatever the measurement was <laughs> that made sense. I don't know what it is. But that was, that was the mentality that was a separate track. I would argue with you just as keyboarding is essential in every single thing that you do, that IT in every industry is essential. What's the largest retailer in the country right now? Amazon. Largest retailer in the country is not a retail shop. They are an IT company. They are a, they, they, they hire, they don't hire 50,000. When they were look, doing their Amazon HQ2 uh, uh, search, they didn't, they weren't looking for 50,000 sales representatives. They were looking for 50,000 software developers. I've been ordering food, as you can see, I'm an expert at it. I've been ordering food for a while, and for the last year, I don't think I've ordered food directly from the company that I was getting my food from. Because I go through DoorDash, or you know, Grubhub, or whoever's got the biggest coupon uh, <laughs> for whatever I'm ordering to eat. But these companies are now essential to some of our more traditional industries. So I would argue with you, argue, argue that support of IT is not just support of industries that exist. So sometimes what we like to do is we like to say, well, if we put a bunch of money into IT, Saran, we don't have any IT companies here. We're all that Sussex County IT firms who are gonna hire these folks. My argument is that IT is no longer just a separate tra track. It is something that every industry, regardless if it is retail, hospitality, construction, agriculture, you name it, IT is essential in those. So the mentality of building a workforce for this particular company who has job openings, we have to rethink that. And we have to start building the capacity of the individuals who are in our workforce so that they can be adaptable and they can adapt to these changing environments in the new industries as they emerge. I've got a couple more on retention, but I want to make sure that I can open it for one or two questions. Recruitment. Recruitment. Recruitment is the Sussex County issue. I hear about it everywhere. I talk to everybody, you know, uh, uh, and I've, I've mentioned this in, 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 our, in our conversations before. Um, as I said, I visit a lot of schools. Let me rephrase that. I used to play football at Dale State. Many of you might notice. Um, and I had somewhat of a positive personality, so my coaches identified me as the person who would shepherd the recruits around. And um, my coaches used to say, you know, I don't care what you're going through in your life today. I don't care, you know, who made you upset. I don't care if you're mad at me, if you're mad at the program, if you're mad at the school, if you're mad at the state, it doesn't matter. Our future depends on you sharing all of the best qualities of this university with those recruits who are walking in today. Because if you don't give the impression that this is where you want to be, they won't want to be here either. And so when we start talking about recruitment, while it's not everybody in here's responsibility to do broad business recruitment or talent recruitment for the state, we all have a part to play when it comes to creating a narrative about our state and our county, right? I talk to kids all the time, and there's no reason that an eight-year-old should say that they don't want to be in Sussex County. They got that from somewhere. It wasn't something that just grew in their mind on its own. We have to be very conscious. We're a small county. We're a small state. We have to be very conscious about how each of us 
are talking about the state of Delaware and Sussex County as a place where people can grow and prosper. We have to make sure that we are promoting what's best about, about living here, great schools, a quality of life, all of those things. Do we have problems? Absolutely. Everywhere else does as well. But we have to be highlighting consistently on a day-to-day -day basis with everyone from the workers that we have in our shop to the kids that we're rearing at home that Delaware not only has opportunities for them, but that it wants them, that it wants them to be here. You know, I, I, would, I would argue with you that as an old millennial myself, um, you know, I have a mindset that I want to be where I'm wanted. The only reason that I went to Delaware State University was because the coach asked me to, to go. It's not like a scientific reason behind it. it he said, I want you to be at Dell State. He drove over to Delaware Bay, or the, uh, Bay Bridge, which I thought he, at the time was the scariest uh, man-made contraption known, you know, known outside of the electric chair. And <laughs> he, he, he crossed the bridge and I was like, man, you must really want me to be there. I want to be there too. When I was walking across the stage at Delaware State University, our former governor and my former boss, Jack Markell, whispered in my ear, don't go anywhere. We want you here. I stayed. Wasn't a scientific reason behind it. I'm sure some therapist or psychologist would probably tell me why that is. My mom didn't hug me enough. You know, my dad didn't play basketball with me enough. Whatever. I'm sure, I'm sure it's some scientific reason why. But what I can tell you is that most people want to be where they're wanted. And so we have to start talking about Delaware and Sussex County as a place that they can grow and we have to start talking to people as though it's a place that they want to be. And so I challenge each and every one of you as you start to engage with your customers, with your clients, with your students, highlight the good stuff. We'll work on all, everything else, but highlight the good things and let them know that you want them here. And I guarantee you they'll make the right decision. Thank you. Do I do questions? Yeah. Um, I know you guys probably, you know, got all your questions out during the panel. Uh, <laughs> but if you have any specifically for me, um, I'm, I'm here until I'm pushed off stage by Bobby. You think I'm going to push him off? <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for Secretary Gates? Oh, the panel's coming back together. <laughs> um, Secretary. Yes. Um, so as part of our community development work with a lot of partners in this room, we, we're working in low-income minority communities, particularly mm -hmm. in Western Sussex County. Mm -hmm. uh, every single one that I speak to that I do community building in has a few issues. One, uh, they all need uh, or they all express a desire for workforce development, training, access to jobs. Mm -hmm. They also express an, a, a a limited understanding of the resources that are out there and available to them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then thirdly, they all generally have some sort of barrier to, to place them in, in a, in a uh, program that would allow them to succeed socially, uh, move ahead. Can you just speak to any of that um, resource that the Department of Labor has or what you're thinking about when you, when you address those issues? Yeah, I appreciate the question. So uh, one of the uh, good things, sometimes frustrating things about working at the Department of Labor is that we can't operate in a bubble or on an island. Um, you know, sometimes we feel like, you know, I guess we could go fast by ourselves, but if we want to go far, we got to go together, is that mentality. Um, and the reality is that the, the things that really move the needle for us in getting people employed is not necessarily just the resources that we have, it's our ability to address the barriers that the workers have. And we can't do that by ourselves. So we've partnered with ent entities like the Department of Health and Social Services who have TANF resources that are available for individuals who may be low income so that they can provide resources then, whether it be transportation assistance or other barrier busting services so that you know, it increases the probability of success for our clients. Uh, a lot of times what ends up happening if we don't have resources to address those barriers, uh, and what some of you probably see as service providers, um, you have to hit your benchmarks if you're a service provider for us. You're, you know, uh, get people connected to jobs, train them up, get them certifications. Um, 
if you don't have the resources to address barriers, you're not going to pick up people with them. You're going to go after the low-hanging fruit, the folks that you know for a fact you're going to be able to get through the program because you have to hit your benchmarks and your goals or you're not going to get more resources from us. And that has been the way that the workforce system has operated for, you know, as long as I've been looking at it. Um, outside of, now, in some cases, that actually worked because it complemented a, 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 an economy and an industry where companies invested a good chunk into their workforces. Uh, and so there were more on-the-job working opportunities. You had companies like, you know, DuPont, or you had companies like the auto plants who had their own built-in apprenticeship opportunities so they could bring people right in off the street, train them up, and get them ready for a six-figure career. Um, because of the fact that for numerous reasons, whether it be the economy, the change of how business operates, uh, the need for more efficiency, and, you know, lack of need for 3,000-person, you know, operations, um, fewer dollars have been invested by some private industries when it comes to workforce development. So those extra resources that we would bring in for that underserved population um, now are, are even more of a drop in the bucket because you had the drying up of some of those private industry uh, 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 assistance. So what we have to do is work with other agencies and work with companies to address those barriers. So some of the ways that we've worked with, I mentioned uh, working with DHSS, some of the ways that we've, you know, we can work with companies a little bit better is uh, supporting companies who provide childcare services for their workforce. Um, you know, we have companies who serve our disability population who provide services to assist them in uh, 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 connecting with work. Um, we have companies who you deal with our TANF population who provide resources and services to help them stay employed. So whether it be things like late night childcare service so that you can get that mom who would, who would be willing to work the late night shift if she had a place to take her child. Um, these are things that private industry uh, needs to work with the state and, and different agencies in order to help invest in. Uh, increase in purchase of care uh, uh, so that we can increase more uh, especially down here, more child care providers and increased number of individuals who are providing child care services and early learning opportunity for our youth. Not only are those important for our youth, but they're important for families so that they have a, a, a great place that's respected that they can take their child so they can get to work on a day-to-day -day basis. So that work is all partnership. I would be lying to you if I told you that I could just go straight to the General Assembly and just say, hey, I need an extra five million so I can deal with Barry shaking his head no. And deal with Barry a reduction. <laughs> I had to throw that out there to see what was going to happen. I was looking for a head nod or two, but I got it. I feel it. Um, but, but, but through collab better collaboration, and it's good that, 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 that it's not the way it operates, where it's not just a scenario where we're just writing a check, because it forces the agencies to work in better collaboration and it forces us to do what we have to do, which is work with the private industry. It can't just be us operating in a vacuum. We've got to work with private industry, not only to be a source of, of, of assistance for them who are doing the right thing, but also to make sure that they recognize that part of the responsibility of their workforce falls to them. Yeah, 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 you got your thing. Do your thing, do your thing. I'm, I'm, you I'm working for you. For a little bit? Oh, he's working for me. Oh, <laughs> well, you serving food, so I'm gonna be here for a while. You're not gonna put me through all this and then send me all on right, without eating. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Saran, for demonstrating your commitment to Delaware's workforce by spending a lot of your day with us today. So not only breakout session, um, but panelists, you know, closing remarks. You know, I've said it before, only in Delaware can you pick up the phone or email a cabinet secretary and be like, hey, can you come and hang out with us at the county conference? And they're like, sure, I'll be there. Even though we were a little stressed when he wouldn't get on the call with us, but it all worked Man, out. You so see how my team is uh, like feels all the Rachel, time. Rachel told me it was going to be okay. She told me so, and I know Rachel, so I, I was good. So, um, but thank you so much. No we're so appreciative. So let me just wrap up a couple things, okay? Lunch is in the lobby, okay? You can eat here or you can take it with you. But I do ask you to fill out the survey, because in case you haven't noticed, we listened to that, okay? So were the changes this year good? Did you guys like the different changes? Okay, good. 
So our poor planning team will be back here Friday morning, planning team, don't forget, um, because we're going to talk about the conference on Friday. And then we all get back together in March and we start our planning again for next year. So if anybody in this audience is interested in joining our planning team, we would love for you to join us. Please reach out to me here at the college. We would love for you to join us. Um, attendees, don't forget to visit the conference website. My marketing team said, please tell the panelists to come up here for a photo afterwards. So when we break here for lunch, so don't leave, panelists. Saran's so staying right here. Look, he's good. Um, and with that, this concludes the 2019. Oh, wait, what did I forget? What's that? Oh, Chris said the survey's coming via email. You don't have to fill out a piece of paper. We're past that now, Chris. Come on. So enjoy. Thank you. <laughs>